Several years ago, I was having lunch with a friend of mine. His name was Ray. And Ray said, Jared, the devil has a filing cabinet. And inside that filing cabinet, he has a file with your name on it. And inside that file, he has written down exactly what it would take to get you to fall. And every day, he is working that angle to get you away from your comfortability in Christ. I'm excited to share with you about my new project. It's called The Gospel According to Satan. Eight lies about God that sound like the truth. As I began to think about what might be in that file, I thought, you know, it's probably not something real obvious. The devil works in very subtle ways. The Bible calls him an angel of light. In Colossians 2, Paul says that it's plausible arguments that can lead us astray. So in this new book, I work chapter by chapter through things that sound like they could be true. Things that we hear a lot, sometimes even in the Christian church. You only live once. You have to let go and let God, or God just wants you to be happy. My hope is that readers will come away with a heightened awareness of the way the enemy tries to get us away from our security in Christ. I hope that it will impact many readers for the kingdom of God and help them see not just how cunning the devil is, but how wonderful the gospel of Jesus Christ is. Hey guys, are you tired of waking up in the morning and doing nothing? Well, we have a solution for you. You can join me and Nicole Wednesday mornings at 8 a.m. on Facebook Live and do Wake Up and Worship with us. All you have to do is get your parents to like the Cornerstone Baptist Church page and you'll get a notification when we go live. We can't wait to see you. Bye.
And so this dangerous question coming into my head at this time from God could only come from God. And this question came, what if at this moment, I would like to renew the Western church? What if I have to let it get so bad? What if you have to get to the point where you're like, incredible worship that just is trying to be as close to the culture as possible, it's not gonna work. Leaders who project this atmosphere and persona of cool and seem really relevant, that's not gonna work. You can download every Netflix series, comment on it, watch every independent movie, listen to every cutting edge album, reference it in your churches, and that's not gonna work because renewals happen when people get to the end of themselves. And there's nothing to rely on except a contending on your knees for God's presence to move. Spring is in the air. And with that, we are expanding and changing around some of our group options that you can get involved with, with digital small groups at Cornerstone. If you head to our website at cornerstonebaptist.ca, you'll see the link on the main page to spring 2020 options. That'll take you to the spring 2020 connect page where you'll see right off the bat, some options for kids ministry and student ministries. Uh, those are groups that the next generation can get involved with. You'll see signups for things like Alpha, for our regular sermon-based small groups. But also now you'll see this group uh, called Book Clubs and Seasonal Classes, where some great books like Blue Like Jazz, which for me was an incredibly formative book in my high school years. Um, something Joel Nineveh is leading, The Gospel According to Satan, which is dismantling lies that the enemy tells us. Complete Guide to Money uh, that, that Josh and Lindsay Andrews are leading. I'm leading one on Reappearing Church, about being resilient disciples in a postmodern world. You'll see these kind of options, as well as our, our prayer gatherings that we have going on. And you can click on any of those to, to get involved or to sign up for them. You can also click on other groups, which will take you right to our group sign-up page, where you can look at the, the unique groups that we have. These are the ones like our lobbies or, or Alpha or some of our, our men's and women's groups and prayer gatherings. Or you could refine your search and just look for some of our regular sermon-based discussion small groups. We're reducing the number of these groups in order to accommodate for some of the new book clubs and other options. Those will be under seasonal classes, where you can see the Young Adults First Corinthians study, Phil's Blue Like Jazz group, my reappearing church group that I'll be leading. You can click on any of these that you're interested in, click join this group, and you can put in your personal information in order for us to confirm your identity and sign you up for a group. So make the most out of your spring and get plugged into a small group, a book club, or one of our other options at cornerstonebaptist.ca. Good morning, Cornerstone. Hello from the Monday Night Small Group. Good to see you. Come join us. We look forward to worshiping with you.
Good morning, Cornerstone. Thanks for joining us from wherever it is you're watching today. I want to start our time with reading to you the words that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. He says, We always thank God for all of you and pray for you constantly. As we pray to our God and Father about you, we think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and the enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. And church, I, I want to thank God for the ways that you've been generous through our benevolent fund. That we've been able to support dozens of families with, with gift cards, with grocery help, with meeting other needs in this difficult time because of your generosity. We're, we're able to continue the partnerships we've had with elementary schools because of, of your generosity through our, our Helping Hands ministry. That the, the Westwood Elementary School in Cornwall, the Glen Stewart in Stratford, and now able to expand that to Montague with the Montague Consolidated School. We're, we're able to sponsor families and help them out through this difficult season. I love how God is providing through his people. To me, that's such a, a beautiful picture of the kingdom of God. I'm excited as well because today we get to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Pastor Gordon is going to be leading us in communion later on in our service. And, and even as you're sitting in your space or your living room or dining room table or, or however you're watching this, I, I hope that this can be a, a, a space where we can celebrate this sacred, sacred meal together, even though we're apart. This week is special as well for us as a church family because we're officially welcoming, welcoming Hannah Bartlett on staff with us as our next gen pastor. Hannah and her husband John recently moved to the island from Wolfville where uh, Hannah wrapped up her studies at Acadia Divinity College. They're currently in their 14 days uh, of self-isolation, but Hannah is beginning her time with us. She's going to be investing in the lives of many of our kids and youth, and she's going to be leading us in prayer later on in our service. So please be in prayer and welcoming Hannah. Reach out to her uh, to welcome her into our church family in this special way. Cornerstone, let's pray together as we begin our time of worship. God, you are good. You are a God who chooses to use us imperfect people to be the, the means of your work, to be your hands and feet uh, in the places that you have placed us. And God, I pray that this morning, however we are engaging, I pray that you would move. Spirit, would you change our hearts and our minds? Christ, would you put yourself before our eyes and our hearts that we would always be looking to you and what you have done on our behalf? Meet with us today, Lord, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Keep your eyes open over the next couple minutes. We'll be sharing the story of someone who's, whose life was changed through getting involved with Alpha. This is an opportunity that's before you, and I encourage you, if you're interested, to look into what it means for you to be involved with Alpha Online. My father was a difficult man to get along with back then. I think he saw God as a crutch, and he saw faith as something for the weak, and he had given his life to things that he saw as valuable. Uh, work and money and material gain. For a few months uh, after I started serving in Alpha, I felt that I should be asking my dad to check it out. But knowing my dad, I didn't think it was actually possible. Uh, until one day I was making myself lunch in the kitchen and uh, he came in and he said, you know, I really have noticed a difference in you. Well, I uh, really honestly didn't want to go, but I'll do anything to support my, my children, and he knew that. Uh, he wanted me to be there, so, so I agreed to attend. The beginning was, because I was reluctant, it was a little uncomfortable for me to go walking in there the first week, but the videos were powerful. The atmosphere was extremely comfortable. It was like visiting with a bunch of friends and having a meal. What I didn't expect was that it, it expanded my horizons and, and opened my heart to, to understand faith better, and I really didn't expect that. Within a few weeks, I was totally enthralled with Alpha and looked forward to going, which honestly was not the case in the first week or two. I wasn't in control. Um, there were things that were working in me that I 
was aware of, but I wasn't very open-minded. And Alpha basically gave me the opportunity to understand myself and my relationship with God so much better. Life is much more peaceful today. It still has its ups and downs. Life's like a roller coaster a little bit, but I think Jesus has kind of taught me to, to enjoy the ride. I invite people to Alpha all the time, simply because I know what it's done for me. Good morning, everybody. Good to see all of you today, and it is fantastic to be worshiping with you. I have Pastor Tyler and Pastor Winston with me today, and we are going to be worshiping the Lord, and we invite you to enter in with us, and it's just a privilege for us to do this with you today. Let's start our time with a word of prayer. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for this gift of time that you have given us, and I pray that you would help us wherever we are, whatever state we find ourselves, to worship you in spirit and in truth today. We pray that you would inhabit the praises of your people and that whatever we're feeling, that what we know would supersede that, God. As you are on the throne, you are our Lord, and as such, help us to worship you in a way that is worthy of who you are. Be with our time together, we pray. Speak, Holy Spirit. Move. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I left my fear by the side of the road I hear you speak, won't let go I fall to my knees as I lift my hands to pray Got every reason to be here again A Father's love, oh you draw me in All my eyes want to see is a glimpse of you
let's do this wherever we are today. I lift my eyes up, my help comes from the Lord. Yes, I do. And 
I can see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him. I can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between less than. I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls came in. Nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between us. next to me there'll be another in the waters holding back the seas should I ever need reminding how good you've been to me I'll count the joy come every battle cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle I know that's where you count the joy Count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be Through every trial Through every trial My soul will sing No turning back I've been set free Stone. My name is Hannah and I'm so excited to be here as your next gen pastor. In just a few moments, we're going to take some time to pray in our own households and our focus this week is on praying for kids and youth. So the young people in our own congregation and across the island in our communities. I know this has been a really scary and stressful time for our kids and our youth as their routines have been totally thrown off and the world feels so uncertain right now. 
We want to pray for them um, that they would feel comforted amongst all the things that they missed out on. I know God has wired our kids to be explorers and to be learners and to make new friends and to have new experiences. And that's something that's just not always easy to do in this season. We also want to pray that they would sense God's presence and they would sense the hope that Christ brings into our lives in these circumstances, that things change, but that Jesus never changes and his love for us is a sure thing. We wanna pray for joy for them and we wanna pray for hope over their situations. We also wanna pray for hope for children and for youth for whom this season has put them in a vulnerable position. We know that there are a variety of factors um, going on right now that make home sometimes not a safe place to be. We are aware that there's mental health issues. We're aware of domestic violence. We're aware that there are homes that have limited resources. Kids may not have enough to eat. They may not have access to the internet, which right now is becoming a very essential resource as learning and connection has moved on to an online platform. We want to pray God's protection over these households today, over these kids and over these youth. We want to pray God's provision for them, that he would meet every need that they have. We also want to pray that God would show us the ways that we could help to meet those needs in our own community. So would you take a moment with us right now and pray for the kids and the youth in our communities, in our congregation, in our own households, and across the island. Just underneath the surface of most people is a little thing called fear, and it's everywhere. In many ways, it's becoming the new normal. You see it in the live comments as Dr. Morrison gives her daily updates, especially as ease back conversations become very, very real and very, very close to our province. You see it in the daily Facebook posts of people who are all in on the latest conspiracy theories, and what's driving this and what's shaping them is driven by nothing more than fear. You see it as you continue to go into stores. While we wait to go into Sobeys or Walmart, people's eyes are still down. Very little conversation, very little laughter, very little engagement with people that we don't know or even people that we do know. When this is all over, I joke with my friends and family that I'm going to run through Walmart, give everybody a giant hug, and might even lick their face just to lance this boil that we can be together again. But I know that there's going to be serious ramifications if I do something like that. If you watch the news at all, fear is everywhere. It's in the headlines each and every day. It's in the rising death toll. It's in the interviews that they choose to show on TV. You see it in parents' eyes. 
fearful that they might be their child's teacher for the rest of their life. Now I know that some of us pretend like we aren't fearful of COVID-19 and all the connected ramifications that it's bringing. But the data suggests otherwise. In fact, the data suggests that lots of people are lying. In a new poll conducted by Legere and the Association for Canadian Studies, they have found that 64% of Canadians are afraid of contracting the virus. This rises to 76% when we think of our loved ones getting the virus. Another writer for the BBC, David Robson, wrote an article where he suggests that one's fear of the virus is actually changing our psychology. He writes, the constant feeling of threat may have other more insidious effects on our psychology. As examples of this more insidious effect, he references the sharp rise in xenophobia and racism in Europe and in North America. These are sad and disturbing realities, but it shouldn't surprise us at all, because fear, when left unchecked, works inside the human heart in such a way that it turns us into incredibly difficult people to be around. It can turn us into angry, controlling people. It can rule and shape our life in that it will determine what we will and won't do. It can fill a person up with hate towards anything or anyone that's different from us in any way. And given how fear is on the rise due to COVID-19, here is my question for you and I to work through this morning. Can fear lead us to faith? Can fear, something that is awful, something that is harmful, something that the evil one uses all the time to bring harm to the human condition, can this thing of fear actually lead us into glorious spaces of faith? To help us answer this question, there are two stories I would direct your attention to. The first one is the story of Rahab. You can read about her in Joshua chapter 2, and it continues on down to Joshua chapter 6. She is a prostitute in the great city of Jericho. If you know the story at all, she's the one who hides spies in her home. And make no mistake, it is fear that compels her to hide the spies in her home. She says to the spies in Joshua 2.9, I know that the Lord has given you this land, and that a great fear of you has fallen on us. So all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. And she goes on to tell the spies all that she knows. She knows that the God of the Hebrews, the living God, has brought them out of Egypt. She knows that God has caused the sea to dry up to allow them to pass through it. She knows that the God of the Hebrews has fed them as a nation for 40 years in the wilderness. She knows that this group of peasants and slaves have defeated significant military forces while on their way to Jericho. And it's out of fear for her life, for the lives of her family, where she invites these spies into her home in an effort to spare her and her loved ones. Just look at this passage, Joshua 2, 12 and 13. Swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family. Give me a sure sign that we will spare the lives of my father, my mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, that you will save us from death. Story two is connected to the Exodus story. And I know that the main characters in this story are God, Pharaoh, and the Israelite people. But I also know that there are other players in the story that we often don't spend a lot of time talking about. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 38, Moses, the author of Exodus, writes, Many other people went up with them, and also large droves of livestock, both flocks and herds. One of my favorite theologians describes the many other people as a mixed group of individuals comprised of Egyptians, other people groups that were present in Egypt alongside Israel while they were slaves. And this group of people, the many other people, they are a witness to God going to work in the land of Egypt through the plagues. They have a front row seat for between six and ten months is what most theologians would suggest the period of the plagues are. This is the most significant human event of God activity in the world, and they are watching it all unfold. And everyone begins to see that the God of the Hebrews is the one true and living God. The gods of Egypt can't stop the flies. 
They can't stop the darkness. They can't stop the locusts. They can't stop the boils, the hail, and all the things that come their way. And these are the very things that the gods of Egypt are supposed to have control and power and authority over. In this moment in time, Yahweh is having his way with them. And now, these many other people get wind of the tenth and final plague that's coming. That around midnight, an angel of death will enter the land and firstborn male child will die. Unless you find a lamb, you take its blood, you put it on the door mantle and doorposts. Although the text doesn't explicitly lay it out like we see in the story of Rahab, I also know that I am a father and that I am a human being. And if I have been a witness of all this unfolding for the last six to ten months, all these plagues, all these things that the God of Egypt cannot stop or, or prevent from happening, I am aware that there is something greater at work in the world, and I am terrified. And as a father who has a firstborn male child, I, out of fear, do whatever is needed to save his life. I find a lamb. In fact, I might even steal your lamb. And I take its blood... And I put it on the top of the door in the post, and I wait. Fear, in many ways, is the new normal. It's shaping so many aspects of our lives. I want to ask you a really personal question. And if you don't know who Jesus is, this is especially for you. What are you doing with your fear? Is it causing you to tighten up? Do you find yourself getting angry over nothing? Are you becoming controlling in whatever you have left to control in your life because you've lost control in the larger spaces? Are you cutting off and ruining relationships? Are you worried? Are you filled with anxiety about things of tomorrow that you don't know the answers to? Or is the fear you're experiencing creating a curiosity in you? Are you actively looking for help? Are you trying to solve this problem of fear in your life? Because in a very real way, Your fear can be the motivating factor in how you start your journey of faith with the living God. We know this is true because of the stories that I've mentioned a moment ago. The stories of Rahab and the story of the many other people. It was their fear that served as the catalyst that caused them to seek and act in faith. And this still happens today. Christianity Today, in an article, which is a really original title, reads... Corona searches lead millions to hear about Jesus. Their data shows that tens of thousands of people have started a life-giving relationship of faith with Jesus Christ, born out of fear they have connected to this virus. There is a story of a woman named Grace. She finds herself on a website dealing with coronavirus fears. In the live chat box on this website, she begins a dialogue with the person on the other side who just happens to be a Christ follower. They recognize what Grace is really after, and there, through a live chat box, Grace begins her journey of faith. In this same article, Michelle Dietrich, Global Media's Outreach Director, she writes, We are seeing millions of people open to talking about faith in the face of fear. She says the conversations they're having normally starts with something to the effect of, I'm not really a religious person, but I don't know who else to turn to other than God. So again, let me ask you, what are you doing with your fear? Is it moving you to spaces to seek help? Because if this is you, you're not alone. There are millions of people around our country and the world that are doing the same thing right now. And it's no different than the fear that began in Rahab and the many other people. And if you go back into these stories, we see that fear is the catalyst to faith. Rahab, out of fear, begins her journey of faith. The many other people in Egypt, out of fear, begin their journey of faith. In a few moments, we will come around the Lord's table together. But before we do, there is one more thing I want to highlight about Rahab and the many other people. It is true, out of fear, they acted in faith. And after this moment, they continued on. Rahab and her family found themselves living in the middle of this community of faith. In Joshua 6, it says, She lives among the Israelites to this day. The many other people found themselves living in the middle of the community of faith. In Exodus 12, 48, it says, A foreigner that's residing among you who wants to celebrate the Lord's Passover must, 
And there's clear instruction now that you're a part of this group of people. This is the way we live together for the glory of God. And here's the point. They both started from a place of fear. They moved into a place of faith. And from there, they were formed for the glory of God. Think of it this way. Fear, what begins here, was a catalyst to faith where they were formed as part of God's people in and through and by His people for the glory of God. So to the question, can fear, something that is awful, something that is harmful, something that the evil one uses to bring harm to the human condition, can this thing of fear lead us into faith? Well, the answer is yes, it can. And it's not because we're clever. It's not because we've outsmarted fear itself. It can simply because God is good. And if we seek Him, He will find us. Fear can lead us to faith because God is good. He is merciful and gracious, abounding in love and faithfulness. He is the good shepherd, the one who goes looking for his sheep, the one who leaves the 99 to find the one who is captivated by fear, to rescue, to save this one. He is the one who, in our time of need, we can turn to and get the help that we need. And listen, God is so good that regardless of where we are at, He can meet us there if you're intellect. He can meet you right there as He did with Nicodemus. If you're filled with guilt and shame, He can meet you there as He did with the woman at the well, Zacchaeus, Mary Magdalene, and the list goes on. If you're filled with doubt and suspicion, he can meet you there as he did with Gideon and Thomas and again, a list of others. If you've looked at every other option known to you and all of those options have failed, he can meet you there as he did with the Roman centurion who went looking for help to find healing for his daughter who was sick. If you're filled with unbelief, he can even meet you there as he did with the father in Mark 9 who asked, help me in my unbelief. If you're filled with pride and arrogance, he can meet you there, because that's where he met me. It's my prayer for you today that you in your fear would turn to the one who can offer real help. Turn to the one and cast all your cares on him. That you in your fear would come to a place where you would be free of it. And walk in this incredible reality where He is with you. This morning, we have a good Father. He can meet you in your fear. Where your fear gives way to faith. Where you would be formed for His glory. Thank you for being with us this morning. God bless. Thank you so much for that word, Pastor Phil. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what think you're like I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father and to you are to you are
undeniable I, I can hardly speak A peace so unexplainable I, I can hardly think I can hear you call me Deeper still Welcome to communion. As we gather around the table today, I hope that you have prepared the bread and the cup to take part. If you haven't, you can stop the video if you'd like and find the instructions on our website at the link uh, and just prepare yourself to take part in this moment. You know, as we gather around this table, uh, Pastor Phil, his sermon is echoing in our ears. He talked about the life of Rahab and the Rahab uh, story shows us really something for our lives. Although her life began in fear, God led her into family and she became a part of the people of God. In fact, uh, it's later revealed that she is an ancestor of Jesus. And in the New Testament, she is applauded for her courage and her faith. As we come into the New Testament as well, uh, we read, the Apostle Paul, writing in his letter to the Romans, talking about how we now, because of Jesus, have transitioned from being slaves to fear to being children of God, a part of God's wonderful family, in security, in love. What a wonderful thing it is that when we have faith in Jesus, it changes our lives, it changes our experience. We're no longer slaves to fear, we're children of God. And as we focus on that love of Jesus that's unfailing, that can't be removed from us, that can't be taken from us, I want you to hear the words that Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 8. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? 
Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. When we come to him in faith and when we trust him, we trust his ways above our own, when our fear drives us to seek him, we find that certain hope in him that can't be removed from us, that can't be separated from us. And as we gather around this table, we are looking at that love that Jesus revealed at the cross. And we are seeing that he faced our greatest human fear, the fear of death. And not only did he overcome it, but he conquered it. And victory is more than ours today because of what Jesus accomplished at the cross. We are the children of God, beloved, safe, secure, when we put our trust in Jesus. So as we gather around this table, we look at the bread, we look at the cup, and we're reminded of how Jesus' body was broken so that we could be healed, so that we could find life, so that we could be accepted into his family. Take that bread and break it. Be reminded that his body was broken for you. And as you eat it, may the life that was in Jesus be in you also. Eat. Take that cup. The cup, Jesus said, is a sign of the new covenant, the salvation that's available for all. You, I, we can be saved because of the work of Jesus. The life that's in him is ours as well. And so as you drink this, be reminded that his spirit now fills you, changing you, making you, when you believe, from a slave of fear to a child of God. Drink. Now let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you have overcome our greatest fear, which is the fear of death. And that the fear we may have in the midst of a difficult time such as this, not even that can separate us from your love. You have demonstrated a strong and powerful love that is greater even than death. And we cling to you because you alone can save. Help us to turn to you in these moments and to find rest and reassurance and peace that your perfect love casts out fear and that we are securely held in your hands when we trust in you as your children. We thank you for your great love for us, the love displayed there at the cross, the life that is available to us because you conquered death by overcoming the grave. Victory is ours because we trust in you. We thank you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. And we celebrate your great love for us. In your name we pray. Amen. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Let's celebrate today. I'm no longer.
Our eyes. 
has been awesome to worship with you folks today. Trust that you have felt the Holy Spirit moving in your hearts and your minds and your lives. I invite you to stay tuned for Pastor Tyler. He has a few announcements that are really important. You don't want to miss any of them. So don't log off. Stay tuned. And God bless you this week. Have an amazing week. And we look forward to worshiping again with you real soon. God bless you all. Thanks for joining us for Church Online today. If you're interested in Alpha, why don't you head over to our website right now, cornerstonebaptist.ca slash alpha, where you can register to take Alpha. Our first session begins tonight and tomorrow night, so you can register on our website there. Normally, when we do communion the first Sunday of the month, we also take up a benevolent offering. And as I mentioned earlier in our service, you've been incredibly generous to our benevolent fund. We've been able to help dozens of families uh, through your generosity. If you would like to give to the benevolent fund, you can do that through our online means. Usually there's a drop down menu where you can designate where your funding goes to, whether to a uh, general operating fund or capital or missions or our benevolent fund. There are plenty of ways for you to give online, uh, all listed right next to me, uh, and you can do that as well as send a check into our office in Cornwall. I want to rem remind you to join us in the lobby after the service today. You can find the link in the description of the video. If you're using your phone or a tablet, usually just by tapping on the, the title of the video, the description will open up and you'll find the link there. We now have a password to the lobbies. It's church all lowercase, um, don't tell anybody. You can find us in the lobby after the service. Now, Cornerstone, I pray that the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, that the Lord would turn his face towards you and give you peace. See you in the lobby.